Good afternoon. Welcome to the Our Places of Impact Community of Practice. My name is Carrie Tyndall and I'm a senior manager with ICF. I lead our TA support team for the series and I'm so excited to welcome all of you today to our eighth event. At this time, I would invite all of you to introduce yourselves as well. Please join us by putting your name and your organization in the chat so we can see who has joined us and so that you all can get more familiar with who else is in the room. While you're doing that, let's go ahead and get started by taking a look at our agenda. Next slide, please. Today's event will focus around the theme of community engagement and specifically around using a participatory research approach. We have some wonderful and exciting guests with us today who have both theoretical and practical experience in using this approach. In just a few minutes, I will introduce our moderators for today's event. After that, they will provide a brief overview of their organization, AmeriCorps, and the participatory research approach. But the majority of today's event will focus around panel discussions with peer organizations, one from the Boston area and one from the Philadelphia area, who have undertaken participatory research approaches in their communities. You will have the opportunity to hear two different experiences using this technique from these panels on different community-led projects or initiatives and how it has helped them to achieve their goals. You will have a chance for some question and answer time with these practitioners to learn more about how you can potentially apply this technique in your own community. And we've added some extra time to today's event to allow for more discussion and engagement between peers on this topic. And with that, I would like to introduce our moderators. Next slide, please. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Robles, who is a PhD and a research and evaluation manager with AmeriCorps. Dr. Robles is a sociologist and has conducted research on an array of community and economic development issues locally, nationally, and globally. She currently works for the Office of Research and Evaluation and manages the volunteering and civic engagement portfolio that builds research on civic engagement, volunteering, and civic health. In addition, Dr. Robles specializes in participatory research and has been incorporating this methodology into AmeriCorps' toolbox of approaches that can increase community capacity, civic participation, and equity. Next, I would like to introduce Melissa Googe. Dr. Googe is a PhD and a research analyst for AmeriCorps, where she works in collaboration with a team of researchers, including Dr. Robles and other program staff to develop tools for collecting, analyzing, and reporting data to increase our knowledge of the impact volunteerism has on communities across the United States. She applies her expertise in participatory research as she manages a portfolio of grantees employing these methods to understand and develop action plans that will improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement. Holding core two and grant management certificate certifications, excuse me, uh, Dr. Googe also oversees contracts and cooperative agreements with an array of institutions to further the mission of the Office of Research and Evaluation. We are thrilled to have Andrea and Melissa with us today to share their expertise and their experiences in applying these techniques with some of their community partners. And at this time, I will hand it over to Andrea and Melissa for their presentation, after which they will introduce our panelists and facilitate those discussions. Andrea and Melissa, handing it over to you. Thanks, Carrie. First, I just want to thank you, your team, and HUD for inviting all of us. I know um, we're a lot of people to organize, and you all have done such a fabulous job. So thank you. Um, and to everyone else, we are just so honored and delighted to join you today and to have a chance to discuss some of the exciting and innovative and collaborative work that our research partners are doing. And as Carrie said, Dr. Melissa Guj and I will provide just a very brief background about AmeriCorps, how we've integrated participatory research into this work that we do, um, and just introduce the basic framework or pillars that we consider essential for this approach. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So AmeriCorps was established in 1993 as an independent federal agency to connect individuals of all ages and backgrounds with opportunities 
to give back to their communities and their nation. So simply put, the mission of AmeriCorps is to improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement through service and volunteering. This year will be AmeriCorps' 30th year anniversary. Three main programs comprise AmeriCorps, and three main programs comprise AmeriCorps seniors, and together have helped to engage millions of individuals in meeting community and national challenges. Um, AmeriCorps is also the nation's largest grant maker for service and volunteering. Uh, so next slide, please. So how does the Office of Research and Evaluation support AmeriCorps and how do we integrate participatory research in our work? So one of the main goals of our office is that we want our information and data to be useful for enhancing our AmeriCorps programs, but as well um, be useful for communities. We conduct research at a variety of geographic levels and use a variety of research approaches. So for example, since 2002, we have partnered with the US Census to field a supplement on volunteering and civic engagement in the current population survey. I know that's a mouthful, but a survey um, for short, we call it the CEV. The purpose of the survey is to identify civic engagement and volunteering trends across the US. The CEV is the most robust longitudinal data on this topic, but since it's national level data, this does not capture information at the local or community level. So after about a decade of collecting national level data, we turn to a group of experts so that they can help us um, make recommendations, help us um, think about how we could expand our data collection efforts and increase our knowledge of civil society more broadly. A major recommendation was to complement the national level survey, the CEV, with different measurement approaches and conduct, re conduct research at the subnational and local levels. To address these recommendations, we developed a research grant competition for universities. But more importantly for today's discussion, we decided that the best way to incorporate local level research was to directly fund scholars and community partners conducting participatory research approaches in their own communities. Um, so before I move on to the next slide, I just want to ask all of you who have access to the chat, if you can just write a few words and tell us if you have or have not heard of participatory research and what you consider the main goals of this approach. Um, we are really interested in hearing from all of you and we'll just be looking at the, the responses as we go. And I think um, we were going to put that in the chat. So next slide, please. So. You know, why participatory research at AmeriCorps? For us, um, you know, participatory research is defined in so many ways, and every practitioner you speak to or a person who's working on this might define it differently. But we think there are three major components to this work that Melissa will describe in more detail in just a minute. However, as, just as AmeriCorps wants to work towards improving lives and strengthening communities through civic engagement, the heart of participatory research is democratizing the research process so that communities can work together to systematically identify their strengths and address challenges while strengthening the civic fabric of their communities, which we know has a ripple effect of positive outcomes. So we believe this is complementary approach, both for building our knowledge about civic engagement, but advancing our agency's mission. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Melissa to describe more about the approach. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrea, and I will echo your thanks to the team for putting this together today. Give me one second. I'm having a technical issue. I will be right back with you in a moment. Apologies for that.
All right, my apologies. I am back in business. So apologies for that. I'm Dr. Melissa Gouge, and I'm here to present a little bit more about what participatory research is. You, you may have heard of it as participatory research, action research, community-based participatory research. Um, but really what we're thinking about today is how we're connecting this work with community engagement or being involved in your in the community. But I'll just take a second to discuss what it's not. It's not a methodology necessarily, it's an approach or an orientation to research. So <clears throat> this means there isn't necessarily one rule book for conducting a study, if you will. Instead, we have a set of guiding principles leading to these long-term research strategies and goals that are part of a research to action process. And this means that the research should be part of a democratic and more equitable process. We are thinking about power sharing and co-learning together. Uh, we are respecting individuals' knowledge, lived experience, perspectives, and at times having to agree to disagree. So thinking of these guiding principles, as the foundation upon which the, these three pillars rest, the essential components of the PAR orientation are community participation, research, and action. And thinking about where it comes from, um, seeking solutions to a community identified problem um, emerged from historical work, if you will, like Jane Adams at Whole House in Chicago, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paolo Freire, and his concept, concept of concienciacion, Orlando Felsborda, Miles and Francis Horton of the Highlander Folk School. And these are all some historical examples of folks who utilized research embedded within community and with community's involvement. And the approach is really unapologetically about bringing people into the research to action process. Folks who have that lived experience, they bring their own perspectives, beliefs, and are interested in using knowledge to make a positive social change in their communities. So, or what we're talking about today, community engagement. So just like traditional research park can lead to peer reviewed publications and books and presentations, this work can also lead to deep and really long-term commitments among folks in community with, with one another, building skills, empowerment of participants and celebration at times as well. So thinking about these guiding principles that make up a long-term strategy where we want to be using it, the tactics we use in participatory research to get her there, or that sense of community building, working with and in communities. Collaboration is key, people with lived experience, folks who have skills in lots of different methods, facilitation skills, engagement, engagement, engagement. Community building with a research team is another one of our strategies. Once you decide to do PAR work, you're constantly building community, and that can mean lots of things. That can mean sharing meals together. That can mean cheesy icebreakers. That can be offering financial support for transportation to make sure folks can get together to meet with you. That can be bus tokens. That can be addressing power differences. That can be offering financial incentives. Whatever it takes to build those relationships, that's what you do to do this work. Thinking of research design and execution, again, this is that community engagement and working together as you design a study. You wanna bring in facilitators who can build skills and teach research methods, designing and collecting surveys, how you might conduct a focus group, how you might make a community map, how you might collect oral histories. Again, you've got community engagement as you design your data analysis and your interpretation. Again, you've got some teaching and facilitation skills because the community comprised research team don't just collect data, but they're also learning and applying data analysis skills to answer those research questions. Community and members are just as involved as they'd like to be. And presenting your findings and you're developing an action plan. That's that third pillar, right? You've applied the principles, communities have been involved from day one, you've done the research, and now what? Remember the third pillar, what do the findings mean? How do we solve the problems we've identified? PARS applied research, we're working together to figure out what to do with it. So again, that reminder of those three pillars of community involvement, action, and research.
One second, I'm having another technical, I apologize for these technical issues. I've got ghosts in the system today. All right, we are back. So thinking about our next slide, please. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about participatory research, and the ways in which the orientation can and has led to more community engagement with our grantees. We've got some links embedded in the presentation that we will be sharing with you later. And you'll wanna check out some links in the presentation. So today we're gonna to hear from two of our grantees who do this really well. Grantees that are working in the West Philly Promise Zone at Drexel University in Pennsylvania and grantees at Tufts University in Boston. So you'll be listening for those three pillars as we discuss this, their work in our Q&A format today. And I'll remind you that the purpose of today's panel is to provide some of these concrete examples of how a participatory research approach can be used to facilitate community engagement and assist communities in reaching their goals. So I have the distinct honor of moderating the Q&A with the folks working on the second story collective project. And Dr. Robles will follow with moderation of the second panel with the folks at CORE, DSNI, and Tufts. So one of our first panelists today, Dwayne Drummond, who is joining us, has been involved in family and community engagement and leadership for most of his adult life. He served as the chairman of the 24th Ward Democratic Executive Committee since 2010 and is the president of the Mantua Civic Association since 2012. And we also have Charles Lomax joining us today as a partner with the Lomax companies. Charles Lomax was instrumental in the growth and ongoing management of the company's healthcare management businesses. And upon the successful exit of those healthcare businesses, he co-founded Lomax Real Estate Partners a commercial and residential real estate development firm. We also have Rachel Wenrick joining us today. Rachel has worked as a waitress, a waitress, a roofer, and a teacher, and all of these jobs required her paying attention. And being a writer has trained her to look at the through lines that intersect to make a larger narrative. As the founding director of Writer's Room, Drexel's University Community Literary Arts Program, she has developed the vision and built the cross-sector partner network needed to realize the Second Story Collective. So our panelists, I'm asking Dee Wayne and Rachel to tell us about the issue in the neighborhood. When Second Story Collective was formed, what was the problem? What were the challenges you were facing? So, um... Just in one word, displacement, gentrification. That's what we was experienced down in Mantua. All right, thank you, Dwayne. That's a concise answer. <laughs> Rachel, do you have anything to add to that as well? Any other? I can add, if you can show the, the next slide, um, we'll give you some, some local context pretty quickly. So we are, we're we're part of the West Philadelphia um, Promise Zone. I saw Carolyn Brown is on the call. Thank you. Shout out to City of Philadelphia. Um, so, what we have happening here in about two square miles is one of the nation's most impoverished communities and a lot of development. Um, in part, being driven by our anchor institutions, which are universities and hospitals, um, and all of this is coming together um, in a in a very small. Um, I'm sorry, in a very small. Um, area. Thank you so much, Rachel, for all of that context as well. So I'll ask the next question to all of our panelists. How did the relationship between the Second Story Collective members come into formation? Who were and who continue to be the key partners you've been working with? Gentlemen, I could, do you want me to kick it off? Get off, Rachel. All right, cool. So um, the slide you see here is is our origin story. It really began with um, with writers' room. All of our relationships were really formed organically, but it took time, right? So writers' room is Drexel's University Community Literary Arts Program. That means we're a program that was formed 
uh, co-created with our neighbors. It's not an outreach program. It was co-created with our neighbors from the beginning. So we're 18 to 80s and diverse in just about every way you can imagine. Um, at the end of our first season of arts programming, one of our founding members was displaced when uh, her building was illegally sold um, and she and her family had to move. And it was the moment where we really understood that we were implicated in each other's stories. And while it was really wonderful to create community through sharing art and stories together, if we were going to create community, we needed to act as community. Um, and so that was the C for this project. Um, but we understood if we were going to try to address gentrification and displacement, it was a huge problem um, and one that required a lot of expertise that that you know we didn't have. And so we began in talking with um, immediately with our neighbors in uh, in Mantua and the Mantua Civic Association, Dwayne Drummond, Ms. Gwen Morris, um, because they knew firsthand the hit the history of their neighborhood. Um, and and their community's hopes and, and dreams for its future. Um, and that's how that's how we began. Dwayne, I'll, I'll toss it to you. I take the virtual mic. Thank you, Rachel. I believe it started off with like relationship building. And I think that was key. And that was a building block and a, and a cornerstone how this partnership and this collaboration uh, came about with uh, the writer's room and also with Mr. Lomax. Um, Mr. Lomax came out to the community multiple times. Rachel uh, approached me a couple of times about this project and it took a while for just not myself, but for the community to understand this project. It, it was first of its kind. And I think it, it really, really started with relationship building. I can go to each one of these uh, panelists and, and, and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about the everyday life and living in Mantua, and that's trust. And trust is hard to come when you're going through uh, poverty or displacement or gentrification. So, um... I mean, Rachel, you know, I, I, I met Dwayne and, uh, and Gwen and Sam, all members of the Mantua Civic Association um, through uh, community meetings. One of the, so, so here's an interesting sort of tidbit is that one of the most, one of the best decisions I made when we started this project is somebody, people came to me and said, you need to hire so-and-so as your community liaison. I was like, I, I, no, I'll do it myself. And so I went and and started to talk to the community, present to the community, and over time um, got to actually know them, know the community, and know um, the the issues and and the people individually as people, um, not as just uh, folks in a in a in the path of a development project. So, um, and that that trust is so critical. What Dwayne pointed out. Um, and then also Rachel jumped me at a community meeting and, you know, told me about this concept and I thought it was a brilliant idea. And out of that, this thing has continued to sort of bloom and grow into something really, really, I think, uh, remarkable. Thank you so much. Can I just add one thing? <laughs> Go ahead, it was, something. <laughs> it, it was funny, like Charles just said something about uh, Rachel. We always have been a communication issue. And it was it was technical stuff about community meeting, and Rachel just came over there and helped us um, do a hybrid model of a community meeting, and that's when all of us got in this, in the room <laughs> together. I remember that that day. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Charles, for saying that. Yeah, communication and trust is a must. Thank you so much. I appreciate you talking about that that organic, authentic experience, and sometimes that's messy, right? <laughs> and real. <laughs> so moving along to the next question, Rachel, um, how, how, how did you all determine that participatory research was an effective community engagement strategy, strategy for this project? Um, so I'm delighted to say that that was when Carol and I met Dr. Ayanna Allen Handy in 2017. Um, at an event when she was on family leave I, um, with her son, Aiden, and she came to an event at the Dornsife Center for Neighborhood Partnerships 
where Writer's Room was born. We met her, we met her mom, we met her son. She met Carol's son. Um, and, and again, like this forming, forming relationships over dinner. Um, and then this is when, through learning about Dr. Ayanna Allen Handy's work, she's an amazing full stop. She is professor of urban education um, at Drexel School of Education. Um, she's also a department head, uh, which is why she isn't here repping the team today. Um, we're pinch hitting for her. Um, and she leads all of our research efforts. Um, she is our fearless leader. And so I need to just start with that. So all of this, this research um, is being led by her. And um, it's how we learn about participatory action research. You know, with, with Writer's Room, we everything we were doing was kind of flipping the script, whether it was arts programming or our approach to higher education or, or housing. Um, and then meeting Ayana and learning that there was this methodology or this approach that was really embracing um, community members' expertise and understanding that, that, that collectively we could um, solve a problem and that that approach would lead to more innovative and equitable solutions. Um, that's when we, that's really when it happened. Um, but as you'll see, like we're in, we're in 2023, it's taken, it's taken a while, right? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And I think <clears throat> you're also talking about being engaging the community, but you're also in the community as well, right? You are members of the community working in the community. Yeah. And but I have to say that that's that's when so that was 2017 and and in 2018 that's when we became when we became AmeriCorps grantees, right? Um, and so it was investment from AmeriCorps that was at a critical moment in this project um, that really allowed us to come together and look at the issue, um, you know, collectively and and try to and try to come up with and develop this alternative strategy. And it was it was actually that work together that that emboldened me to, as Charles says, jump him at a community, <laughs> right? <laughs> and to say, hey, hey, look, you know, like we're all trying to work on this on this uh, on this issue together. Um, and so it's really the 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 investment from AmeriCorps starting in 2018 um, and continued investment has been absolutely critical. And the ripple effects of that um, have just been astounding. And now we're now currently National Science Foundation uh, Civic Innovation um, grantees. But all of that started with um, that first call in 2018 with AmeriCorps. Yeah, thank you. It's, glad, it's delightful to hear that, Rachel. So, um, Dwayne and Charles, if you can share a bit about your experience uh, with participatory research before this project and this collaborative relationship. So, um, for me, it, um, it, you know, it's, it's my experience is that it takes, and this is personal, it takes four meetings before you can go somewhere and people actually start to see each other as human beings and, 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 and start to develop sort of a real relationship and that trust. And I think that, um, and Dwayne referenced it, I think Rachel referenced it, that is really how sort of that participatory, it's engagement. I mean, it's really, you can't participate unless you engage. And that engagement is, is critical. Um, and that's, that's sort of what has informed um, uh, my approach to uh, community development. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that the project itself is a, it, it's a very Philly centric project. Philadelphia is the kind of place where relationships go back generations. I mean, I was born at 42nd and Larchwood, which is in West Philadelphia, not far from um, Mantua. Um, but their relationships in Philadelphia, it's such a, it's a big city, but it's really a sort of a small town. And those relationships really help inform um, the trust and the, the collaboration, which is, I think, is what makes a lot of what makes Philadelphia so special. And Rachel, I'll follow up with how how you engaged in participatory research with the community. And we'll tee up some questions for Charles and D. Wayne to think about what might some of the challenges and roadblocks be. So we'll we'll get to that next. Absolutely. So, um, because we start with story and storytelling, and that's how we built community. Um, that that really became the 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 focal point of of how we do this work. Um, in fact, when we were first um, 
Duane, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell that story about about with Ayana and you and talking about the surveys. So um, this is a community in the West Philadelphia Promise Zone, Mantua. Um, there, you know, it's a community that has been um, extensively surveyed, right? And often, and often communities, right? You're asked what would what would what change would you like to see happen, and then you know you put all this time in, and then you're still waiting for the change, right? Um, and so when we were co-designing this study together, and, and Dwayne um, is a is a researcher on that study, Ayana asked him, you know, about the methods and about you know how we might do this together, and 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 I remember Dwayne, you said like, well, it can't be surveys; it, it's got to be more like what we've been doing with writers' room, right? Which is like playing the music, breaking bread together, um, coming together, telling stories, making art together. Um, and so that's that's really become kind of the, the center point of, of, of how we approach the work. And something that we've been working on for, for 10 years, that approach. Yeah, thank you. Dwayne, would do you mind telling us a little bit about how um, this approach ensured that as many stakeholders as possible were engaged and had their voices heard? So my uh, motto for for my organization is plan or be plan for. So basically it's saying if you're not at the table, you're going to be on a menu. So we had to take it to the streets. We really had to take it through the streets because we had a visible bully on our hand called COVID-19. So we social distance and gather people together, but kind of separate with our six feet and, and see what they they wanted. I, I was seeing uh, men of color I, during this whole process. We would give out food and I was seeing men of color pull up to get food with a baby carriage. I ain't never seen that day in my life until COVID-19 and it was a lot of people. We was reaching uh, a lot of folks that we normally wouldn't reach through COVID-19. So yes, people needed uh, access to food because we was in a, a food swamp. And people needed to have some communication because COVID-19 left a lot of people isolated. And we used that not as a, a roadblock COVID-19, but we used that as a as a win for us to get uh, community engagement now and get communication and to like we've been talking about build relationships because people were tired of being isolated, so we built relationships and um and we engaged and we had collaborate and we going to keep our commitment to a long term um, engagement for this process. Yeah, thank you, Duane. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask this to the group. Um, how has the community insight that you got through this participatory research method wound up to contribute to changes in the design elements of the project? And I'll, and I'll, yeah, it looks like Duane's getting ready to hop in. So I, I take it back to the whole community engagement piece by uh, having community meetings. We actually had multiple community meetings right outside where the proposed project is going to be built. So um, it was multiple, multiple, multiple meetings. I think we was meeting, Charles, you could correct me if um Ron, we we was meeting for almost like three years. Yeah, right during on this, this this project. Yeah, right, right. I'm talking about right outside, winter coats on and everything, gloves, scarves, hats. So that's how we got the community involved. People was riding in the street in a car, just hopping out, like, what's going on? That normally didn't come to a meeting. So I think we had to, you had we had to, we learned that we had to meet people where they are at. And sometimes people is not going to come to no no meeting. Sometimes you got to meet them on the street. That sounds like real community engagement. Yes. Yeah. 
Charles, um, just to ask you directly as a developer or as, as you, <laughs> um, how has the process changed your community engagement strategy for other projects you might be working on or as this one grows? Well, you know, the, the thing that's become really, really um, apparent through the process is there's, there's an affordable housing crisis in the country. There's a senior housing crisis in the country and there's a crisis of loneliness. And so, you know, in, in my mind, as we look at any, any projects, those are always there. Um, how do we address those concerns? There's a, there's a food sovereignty issue. There's a healthcare crisis in this country. I mean, and these are all sort of um, issues that a lot of times are looked like looked at as they're in silos. This isn't just housing. It's not just um, food security. It's not just health care. It's not just uh, education and, and community engagement. All these things need to sort of play and work uh, cooperatively together so that um, you really are addressing um, the issue in a sort of a holistic way. The other thing that I, I find really interesting is that um, gentrification looks different when you're an owner. And, you know, when we were initially started, the issue was density, too much density, you need to reduce the density. And then when we started talking about this co-living model with Rachel, where seniors can age in place with support um, from community members and, and uh, the institutions, um, we can change, we changed our townhouses, these 16 townhouses to duplexes. So there was a, there was a, a receptivity to increasing density, but it has to be in a way that's equitable and fair and allows community members to actually realize real um, measurable benefits from those types of changes that are occurring as a result of, of development. Yeah, thank you. So we have about two minutes left. And I'll just ask you all to offer either some parting words or what some of the lessons uh, you have learned in utilizing this process together have been. I'll go, I'll go back to Dwayne. Trust is a must. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good saying, Dwayne, because uh, that's it. I mean, you, you have to, and you have to, it takes time. It doesn't just happen. I think that's so important and, and also being able to sort of stick with the process and keep engaged and keep communicating because th there's so much to be learned through that process. Yeah, thank you. So we're hearing this right relationship, trust, continuing to be engaged. I love hearing this and I love hearing the specific stories of how you've all done it. Rachel, before we hand this over to our next panel and Dr. Robles for the Q&A, would you offer a lesson learned or parting words for the audience? Absolutely. Actually, would you mind just showing the last slide? Because I think it's it really um, encapsulates our, our approach and, and where we're at. You know, this is uh, Ms. Pat Burton with some high school students and college students and alum, right? And it, I think what we've learned in this process um, is like who we are is enough, right? That we can contribute to these huge, seemingly insurmountable problems if we only take the time to listen to one another, to work in community, to work collectively, uh, to try to problem solve, um, to have some vulnerability, right, um, together. And, um, you know, Melissa, really, we were, we were doing a little prep call before this, and, and Melissa said, you said, um, this is about the expansiveness of our dreams. Um, and that might sound hokey in this day and age, but it's like, that's really what this is. And that's what we've all been um, willing to fight so hard for is we see that this is something that, you know, everyone can contribute and everyone can benefit. And that is so rare these days, but to see the power in that and, and the implications for how many people's lives can be changed by it um, is enormous. Um, I'll also say like another thing is it is cross sector work. It is cross agency work. It takes everybody and all we have to make it go. Um, and, and so the, the more support that we can get for that, the better, because we really are on the cusp of some, of some transformative work that can address some of these major crises that we are experiencing in our country. 
Thank you so much for offering that there. I don't think there's any reflection I could possibly offer that would be any more moving than that. So how about we hand it over to the next panel and <laughs> give them some time and, and we'll learn from them as well. Thank you all so much. Hey, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Rachel, Dwayne, and Charles. Um, always love to hear about your work. So next we will hear from, uh, talk about a project in Boston called the Co-Research Co-Education Core um, in the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, so first, uh, I'll just introduce the three panelists. We have Ken Lowe, who is a distinguished senior lecturer and director of the Master of Public Policy Program and Community Practice at Tufts University's Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning. From 1996 to 2009, he served in various roles, including executive director at Alternatives for Community and Environment, um, a Roxbury-based environmental justice group. He holds an MS in environmental science and policy from the Energy and Resources Group of the University of California at Berkeley and a BS in electrical engineering from MIT. Next, we have Minnie McMahon, um, is the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network Coordinator, hosted by the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which also um, is DSNI. She started at DSNI in 2019 as the Project and Operations Manager at Dudley Neighbors, Inc., the Community Land Trust. Before that, many worked for small farms in Massachusetts, California, New York, growing flowers, developing systems, and advocating for workers' rights. John Smith is the Executive Director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, and prior to that, he was the Director of Programs at TSNE Mission Works. John brings extensive experience in the nonprofit government education advocacy fields to his role at DSNI. He served as a policy analyst in the Mayor's Office of Economic Development for the City of Boston, where he managed major economic development policy initiatives. So welcome all. Um, I hope uh, I can't see if everybody's camera is on, but so please feel free to get on. And so just as Melissa did, I'm just going to start asking some questions. So, John, I'm going to start with you. Uh, can you tell us about the issues in the neighborhood when the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative was formed? And the second part is how did DSNI work with universities, including Tufts uh, Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning? John, are you on? I don't it's think John couldn't make it. So oh, okay. Minnie, Minnie is prepared to, to okay. take this on. Great. So Sorry about that, Minnie. Minnie. No, no, quite all right. Yes, thank you. Thanks everybody for um, this panel and, and for joining in the audience. Um, so Dudley Street, um, so sorry, the question is about the early days of, of Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Yeah, what the community was facing back in the, the 1980s um, was a tremendous amount of disinvestment from the public sector um, and also some early speculative activities from the private sector that was um, envisioning that this neighborhood, which is historically a working class neighborhood, um, immigrant neighborhood, largely people of color, um, particularly black, African-American and Cape Verdean Creole, um, Cape Verdean in the last uh, three or four or five decades. Um, it was really disinvested and there were big external plans for um, development of the neighborhood. And the community um, saw what was happening and said, no, we, we, we need to be planning for ourselves and our community and we'll work with, you know, we need money, we need technical support, um, but we're not gonna get, we're not gonna get um, plowed over as we've seen um, the state do time and time again with, you know, in partnership with private actors. So um, the organization formed, around um, community efforts to push back against external interests coming in, uh, to clean up what were um, a lot of vacant um, or abandoned lots. There's a lot of illegal dumping, dumping happening in our neighborhood. So there was also just some basic community organizing efforts to, to, clean, up, to clean up the neighborhood, um, to close illegal transfer stations, and then to really plan for a longer term vision for this neighborhood. Thanks. So how um, did you start working with uh, Tufts or the Department of Urban Environmental? Sure, yeah, I, 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 kind, 
I, I, one thing I'll mention, I'll, Penn can answer that better than I, but um, the in the early days of of um, the real attempts to for community control of this neighborhood. So we're looking at about um, a 60 acre area in Dorchester and Roxbury. Um, the community really did rely on external partnerships, including um, a need to research around, well, who owns what land? Because there was a big effort for the community to actually um, uh, get control and ownership over land through the power of eminent domain. Um, and we needed support in researching who owns what, how can we go to them and actually acquire the land? But I'll let Penn um, speak to the Tufts relationship. Yeah, um, the, like Minnie said, DSNI really did have a lot of support and partnership. A lot of folks in urban planning departments um, were really there to help support. I think this is very similar to what we heard in Philadelphia, support a community process and for the communities to facilitate and develop their own master plan. Um, and Tufts was amongst those universities involved. In fact, one of uh, the founding board members of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, Melvin Colon, ended up teaching at Tufts in our department all through the 90s. And so that continuing engagement was built up over you know, decades at this point. Um, and I had the uh, fortune of, of picking up on that relationship and um, you know, I think the lesson we had heard from the Philadelphia story that, you know, it takes time to build relationships. My own relationship to DSNI goes back to the first day I started at that organization ACE in 1996, mm -hmm. which we partnered with DSNI on a number of initiatives, um, including working on those uh, illegal, you know, dumping um, situations that many had, had mentioned. So, so I've known and worked with DSNI since 1996. And so, um, I kind of fast forward a little bit. I think the, the time period that we'll be talking about is fairly similar to, to what we heard with the um, story of Drexel and West Philly. Um, our work in this co-research co-education partnership goes back to, you know, about 10 or about around a decade ago is when we started to, when I first got to, to Tufts and tried to figure out how do we deepen this partnership? How do we um, go from uh, you know, universities, I think, have a lot of commitments where they send students out to do service or to do different types of learning and research projects. But almost all of those are short term, semester to semester, um, oftentimes ad hoc. And what we realized was we have an opportunity to really work with a partner who isn't going anywhere and university is not going anywhere. And how do you build over time and perhaps even generations? Um, so we said, let's try and figure out, can we develop a plan to work together for three to five years? And let's put together all the activities that are happening under teaching, research, and practice. And let's figure out what do we need to learn together? What does do folks at DS and I really want this partnership to focus on to help them do their work better? And so um, this is the core model. Um, that's the, the slide that you're seeing there. If we can go on to the next slide, I can share a little bit more about some of the elements that were involved. Um, so we actually got a three year uh, written memorandum of understanding that um, went from 2016 to 19. It was actually during this period that we were able to apply uh, to the AmeriCorps Community Action Research Grant Program. And, uh, and that really helped propel our efforts. Um, but, you know, one of our premises of, of doing this type of partnership work is, is making sure there's equitable funding. Um, so basically we've, we've divided the funding half and half between DSNI and Tufts. Um, we have focused on supporting the work that DSNI has been doing around their community land trust and community control over development mm -hmm. um, with a particular focus on looking at the food economy. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've, we've kind of packed all kinds of stuff into this. So we actually co-designed a whole practicum class Actually, Minnie, when she was a master's student in our department, was in that class. Um, we've sent students out to work with DSNI for semester-long spring field projects. It's a required class for all of our master's students. Um, we've supported our grad student students to do summer um, internships and fellowships. A number of them have pursued master's theses that have uh, continued to work with DSNI. 
And we've also even developed a popular education training called Teaching Democracy as part of our, our partnership. Um, if you can go one more slide. Um, I'll just say, you know, different, there's been a lot of different aspects of participatory research. This is one of the very early ones mm -hmm. where um, folks at DSNI had already started a, um, a community food hub and wanted to do an inventory and just baseline, you know, how much growing is actually happening in the neighborhood, right? It's not just the established community gardens or urban farms. But we knew that lots of folks were doing growing in their backyards, on their back porches, you know, in their front yards, <laughs> everywhere, basically. So we actually co-designed this uh, survey, and then we worked with um, the youth program at DSNI that summer uh, to do a walking survey of the entire neighborhood and try to talk to as many gardeners as we could to figure out the extent of the growing that was already happening. And, um, and the snapshot we came back with was, was incredible, right? 65 gardens within a very small area growing um, something like over two tons of, of produce. Um, and, you know, so again, showing that the assets, the thing, these were already happening in the neighborhood. Um, why don't I pause with that? Because I think there's a lot more that we've planned to, to talk about and we can maybe advance to the next slide. And the next Thank question. You. Thanks. Yeah. And I'm seeing uh, in terms of both of your presentations, you know, again, the, that length of time, this is a long term relationship, but also in both of yours, the, the importance of the visual component. You know, I see the maps, um, the art, the storytelling in the other in the other presentation. So uh, let's see, Minnie, how have Tufts and DSNI been partnering? to support DSNI and the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network. So maybe a little bit about that. Sure, so the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network is um, hosted by DSNI, which is home to um, one of the oldest community land trusts um, in the country and also in the city. And um, and, and this network, this really sort of peer-to-peer sharing, learning, and also advocacy network um, for similar type organizations across the region was formed in 2015, 2016 with the support of, of Tufts. We had, um, we had a student who researched and then ended up um, creating a, a practical master's thesis on sort of hub and spoke models. So looking at different ways that a network um, can be can be structured and support its membership. Um, so that was some sort of um, interesting, useful organizational research to help think about how this network itself could actually be practically um, structured and and applied. Um, so that they helped the Tufts supported with the launch of this network back in 2016. There was a major event that required quite a bit of support. Um, and convening some community process around that. There have been ongoing field projects. Um, Penn mentioned those semester long projects. So we've had, you know, we think of Tufts as kind of the research arm for DSNI. So we've had a number of very practical um, projects like, you know, how do we create a pipeline of land and housing into community land trusts, looking into tax benefits and trade offs. And the sorts of things that are really crucial for our work, but we don't have a lot of time to get into um, as sort of practitioners. Um, Penn mentioned the community practice class that I myself was a part of. Um, currently, I'm working with community practice students um, who are developing some sort of marketing materials, communication materials um, for our network. So they're doing like a video interview to help us communicate about our work. Um, there are lots of examples. Another actually is um, there Penn, Penn with some students this past summer um, authored a report um, that was published in a very um, locally prominent <laughs> um, publication, the Boston Housing Report Card. It was a special section on the work of community land trusts and the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network, um, and made that really help make that easy for us um, because of the long relationship, because of Penn's understanding of our work. Um, he was able to really do the work of authoring, but have us guide it, 
Um, so, so that was a very um, great sort of alliance and and way that Tufts and Penn and that um, the core was able to really lift up what we do here at DSNI. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the time and moving on to the to the next question. So, um, you know, one thing with participatory research is that knowledge building, the skill building that happens across um, the community and for and and researchers who are working on that and students and so forth. So, uh, this is for both of you. How has the core partnership helped to build upon and enhance community capacity for participatory in action research? So, Pan, do you want to start? Sure. Um, actually, if you if we can have the slide advance just one, I just wanted to show folks that, you know, um, Mini now is helping to bring together um, seven community land trusts all across the Boston area who are also building up. And um, this is a this is a map that we were able to create for that report that she just talked about that came out um, just this past fall, and. Um, Let's see, why don't we go to the next slide and I'll just kind of talk through, you know, Minnie's already said a little bit about how um, we've had this partnership for long enough that, you know, DS and I can, we have a division of labor in a, in a little bit of a sense, you know, like they can count on us in a certain way for certain types of research that they don't have time and capacity for. Um, you know, for us, like the participatory part of this, like, you know, there's some versions of participatory research where you want the partnership, both partners involved all the way through equally. And for us, not every project works that way. You know, sometimes it's just uh, commissioned and that's a lot of like what the field projects are. Um, but I do wanna show something here where it was much more participatory all the way through. And in fact, I would say probably we were at Tufts more or less, you know, we, we were put into a situation where we were just trying to help whatever we could in a process that DS and I was already embedded in. And this is actually a project that's, you know, in some ways very parallel to what we had just heard about from uh, West Philly and a development. This concerns Upham's Corner. There's um, a big uh, theater there. There's been, you know, kind of commercial um, revitalization projects that have been trying to, to happen for the last couple of decades. Um, and the city really focused on this area as kind of a hub for an arts and innovation district. DSNI got involved and basically co-facilitated the, the community and city planning process because they owned one of the major sites for redevelopment, a former bank building. And so, and actually while Minnie was a student then became a staff person was when a lot of this planning was happening. And, um, you know, and, and maybe I'll, I'll push it over to Minnie just to, Say a little bit more because she was, like I said, much more involved in this um, being on the DSNI side. But uh, we were able to work again with young people over a summer, and there was all kinds of engagement and community process that happened also over multiple years, probably about three years of very intensive uh, community process that has now led to um, a redevelopment plan and a developer chosen um, for now a site that's called Columbia Crossing that's going to have what about 50 units of, of affordable housing. So, um, Minnie, why don't I pass it over to you to say a little bit more about some of your experience in how this kind of participatory research worked. Yeah, thanks. So, um, as a, on the student side of things, um, you know, as a student team, I was partnered with DSNI um, to start to document some of this bigger planning process that Penn's talking about. Um, and then that over over the years and roles changes, whatever, that transitioned into Penn's team um, coming to all of the work, the sort of public meetings, the working advisory group meetings, and just, and really like verbatim documenting what was happening. That was a very passive role but very, very helpful um, for DSNI to go back and look at notes in our partnership with the city, for the city to go back and look, and look at notes and say, these are the things people are bringing up. This is what we want to get into next. Um, and let's really sort of like as a really helpful accountability measure to have this third party there who could really get serious about docu documenting what was happening. Um, and 
Tufts also ended up playing a role. Um, we had DS and I had a steering committee, a resident steering committee that was making an important decision about what developer would develop sort of an anchor, an anchor building in this wider project, um, a building owned by our community land trust. And Penn and his team were really thought partners with us. I know that's sort of like a maybe a term, a term, but it's a useful term. Really helped us think through um, how to support the residents in um, looking at a request for proposals and understanding the development process and understanding financials, what's feasible, what's not, how far can we push, what can we ask for. Um, so Penn and his team were really um, sort of like partners with us in, in like consulting with us on strategy, um, as well as, as really co-creating and co-leading um, uh, Edu like education processes to get the steering committee members um, uh, ready to make these really important decisions and to walk through that together. And then, yeah, I guess I'll mention I, one thing I'll mention that hasn't come up, or maybe you mentioned it, Penn. There was a summer that we were working with um, maybe about eight young people, eight high schoolers um, from the neighborhood and, and intensively engaging with them around what do you want to see in this building? How can this building serve you? If this were a community building owned by us, what would we do here? How would we do it? And Penn and his team and I really partnered to support those young people and walk through that, that summer process together. So there have been just a number of projects and collaborations, even within this, this larger um, theme of a redevelopment of Upham's Corner. Thank you. So I'm looking at the time. We have a few minutes, but I do want to hear, you know, um, a lot of times it's great to hear the successes, but again, the challenges are really important as people are trying to do this. So I just want to hear from you, you know, maybe some of the challenges or roadblocks um, to the partnership, um, the community university partnership with uh, the participatory research process or working together or the relationship. <laughs> and then I'm going to end with one last thing, so. Mindy, do you want to take this one first? Sure, yeah, I think I think with Tufts, in my experience, it's been very, very smooth um, in contrast to sometimes working with other universities because a lot of people want to work with us and do. Um, but, but I think something I've seen, yeah, that sort of turnover of students, you know, projects tend to be shorter term, like Penn mentioned, or how much can you really ask of students? How much can they ask of us? That's always going to be a dance um, because you want to be in partnership. You don't want to be using each other, but you know we also sort of have different interests and different schedules and that stuff. So just figuring that out can be enough of a barrier that, frankly, frankly, has made me not want to work with certain parties. You know, not because they're so bad, but just the nature of it. That hasn't been the case with Tufts because of the relationship, because of the knowledge, because of the true partnership. I think a particular challenge, a challenge that has come up, including in the Tufts relationship is, um, you know, maybe our members or people who aren't intimately involved with DSNI, who are maybe par become part of our processes might say, well, who's, t what's Tufts doing here, right? Because of that, that historical, um, division between between the sort of you know the elite academic and then like the rest of us vibe <laughs> so yeah pen yeah i'll just add one more which is that um you know we've really got to watch out for reinforcing kind of these knowledge hierarchies that that i would say universities are very good at creating you know kind of who's got the best you know, research and best knowledge. And um, because so much of the work that I and students do is is really helping to collect and make visible the knowledge that already exists in communities. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and and it's hard because sometimes the the community partner and sometimes even with DS and I, we were like, okay, we're gonna do this big public event. You know, why don't you present, you know, the report that you and your students did, right? And, um, and they want that because they want the credibility that comes along with the university name, mm -hmm. right? But then it makes it seem like, you know, we kind of know something more than the community when all the knowledge came from the community in the first place. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to kind of name that as something that we've got to continually uh, watch out for. 
Thank you. And I see it's 206 um, and maybe in the next section, I'm going to hand this over. Um, you could just maybe add some parting words um, if the opportunity comes up, but I just don't, I want to make sure that people have time for Q and A. Okay, so I am turning this over. I think it's to Evelyn. Thank you so much, Panamini. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Megan, for facilitating our panel discussions today. My name is Evelyn Bando, and I am a senior manager with ICF, and I will be facilitating some general audience Q&A for all members of our panel today. So I would invite you, if you have a question for the panel, to please drop it in the Q&A box. And I will ask, actually, Penn and Minnie to come back online because I can ask the remaining questions of you. And so I'm curious to know what were some of the lessons learned and then what parting words do you have for the audience in terms of um, when a community organization wants to partner with a institution of higher education or vice versa? And whoever would like to start. And why don't you go for it? Sure. Um, I'm just going to repeat something that the last uh, team, the last panel did, which is just that relationships are central. Can't really do any other stuff without it. And, um, and it takes care and feeding, you know, to make sure the relationships, it's not just, you know, you make it once and it's good. You got to keep, keep doing it and put in that time. Um, I think the other is just that it, it really pays off to to do your work in a reflective way. So taking time to reflect and evaluate and to do that together, especially in a partnership, is super important. So um, so we found, you know, every time we've taken the time to do that, it's it's really been valuable and again helps to build the relationship and make the partnership stronger. All right. Many anything to add or yeah, well, I guess it's an observation. So I agree, definitely the relationships and we've had, um, you know, the one with UEP and Penn is special because it really is a partnership that we've talked about in a number of ways. Um, we also have ongoing relationships with professors from other universities who really care about our work, want to bring their students in, want them to learn from us and just be exposed to um, our sort of way of thinking and doing and that's really great and i think it they are the sort of individual link between the university and us and i think the importance of yeah the structure the department being on board um and what the sort of the professor the sort of like advocate inside the university can do to get the full backing of the institution is just so an important element um i think to thinking through these partnerships Great, thank you for saying sharing. So what I'm hearing is basically the relationships are plants. You need the right food, the right nutrients, the right soil, the right environment for just like in nature, the relationships to prosper to the extent of what they can be. Nicely said, yes. You know, you can tell I'm a plant lady, I try. <laughs> so I'm gonna open up with a broad question to anyone on the first two panels, or maybe we could actually start with AmeriCorps because I am curious to know, and I'm sure participants are as well, how did AmeriCorps get involved with these two partnership initiatives? And I heard the word investment, so I'm curious to know more about what that process was like, how did it come into existence, and then how did it support the beautiful things that we see today? Yeah, so I'll say a couple things and I wanna uh, hear from Melissa. We are just so proud and excited and honored that we have this great group of people. And just like you see with Philly, West Philly and with Boston, um, we have maybe 16, 18, 20 other projects that are doing participatory re research across the country. And um, like I said, at the beginning, we, you know, we're doing this high level research, this national level research, and we just really felt that AmeriCorps is about communities and strengthening communities. So what other kinds of research could we do? Because for me, participatory research is not just 
you know, if you think of civic engagement, you heard these two presentations. You need trust. You need people. Dwayne was talking about meeting people out in their cars. I mean, um, just by the process of doing this, you have to be civically engaged, right? And then it's also an outcome. Like if you listen to all the different ripple effects that these two um, projects are talking about, we see the same thing in all the other projects. So we really believe this um, type of work can build knowledge across, you know, a, like Penn is saying, this isn't just one set of people getting bringing knowledge. The, you know, anyone who participates brings their knowledge, their expertise, um, and you know, knowledge is power. And um, and the different types of networks and connections that you make. So anyway, we love this, and um, we just hope that we can continue this. So Melissa, yeah, thank you, Andrea. I think Andrea offered the that aspirational, I idealistic. You know, this is why we do this, and I'll just offer. A little bit of the nuts and bolts that we offer um, a cooperative agreement competition. These are all these are but two examples of folks who applied for funding who rose to the top of the competition and we had funds to um, award them cooperative agreements uh, to do this work in partnership with their with all the community folks they've been working with. So that's the less exciting um, <laughs> answer, but it's a yeah, they're all cooperative agreements that were awarded through a competitive process. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that clarification. And that information is all on the AmeriCorps website in terms of resources available and when next competitions are coming up and things like that, right? When they're available. All right, very good. Okay, so my next question is for our first panel. I'm curious to know if other communities want to engage arts as an approach to collaborative and participatory community engagement, where would you recommend they start? And what are some of the key things that should be considered as they're looking at an arts based approach? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would say really start start with with the folks who are there and their histories and 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 what they want to do together um what we were very lucky with writers room in that in that our charge was was really to work students and neighbors together and build something together and so everything that we have done has been in co-creation whether it's forming the program or 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 pursuing a housing project um, we have a photography uh, program um, sponsored by Canon, actually, because our students and neighbors together said, gosh, we'd, we'd really love to document some of the changes that are happening in the neighborhood. We'd love to be able to take portraits and things like that. And so it's really, um, it's really about sort of talking with folks who are already there and identifying actually the, the organizations or, or the people who have the expertise who are already doing it instead of trying to create something new. And I think that that's been... That's, uh, I think, a real hallmark of, of the participatory research approach and of our arts approach is not trying to, to recreate something, um, you know, whole cloth, but to, to look around and, and talk to folks and say, you know, what's already happening that we could plug into or support or amplify? Um, and then, you know, how can we make something new together? Often, often there's public arts programming that's happening in your in your neighborhoods. Um, and then it's it's, you know, maybe just trying to sort of connect some dots. Great, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add regarding that? And then we have a question from the audience that reads, I feel like Mr. Lomax was receptive to the participatory process and wondering if the panel has any insights to share on how to use this type of approach with other developers who may not be as engaged or supportive to such a process. So whoever would like to answer or any insights provided. You know, this is, this is Charles. Um, you know, I think that, that, I think that what's happening as it relates to community development, it's evolving to something that's um, much more holistic and um, 
collaborative. And I think that, you know, it, it, it's interesting because it's much more, it's, it's not the easiest path forward, but at the end of the day, it's probably the, the net result is infinitely better. And it, it, you know, the, the resistance that you get because of the issues of gentrification, which are all warranted. Um, when you sit down and start having a conversation and going through this participatory process, um, it's, it's, it's engaging, it's empowering, and it's, it's like the right way to go. So I don't think that, you know, I, there's nothing that unique about, about a Lomax Real Estate Partners as a developer. I think that anybody who's paying a little bit of attention um, is going to see that this um, is, is a way to really do this in a, a much more collaborative and effective way. You, you avoid a lot of the resistance that you historically will get when you're doing this kind of stuff, this kind of work. If you engage in a participatory process where people actually are engaged, the earlier, the sooner they're engaged, the more effective it will be. Thank you. Rachel or Dwayne, anything you would like to add? No, I think Charles covered it. Thank you. So it sounds like engaging in processes where we see people's humanity is where we are able to move forward with collaboration and progress. So thank you. So my next question is for our second panel, DSNI and Tufts. If a community is interested in partnering with their local higher educational institution to support this type of community engagement, where would you recommend they begin? And what are some of the best practices that should be considered as they're planning this out? And whoever would like to start. Can I just clarify the question you're asking about if you're on the community side and trying to and wanting to partner or yes. Okay. And then you, you could also um, address it from the university side. You know, if you're looking to partner with the community, what are some of the best ways to approach it as well? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to actually invite um, Minnie to. She's she's seen it both sides, but she's on the community side right now. All right, if many, if you would be uh, welcome to answer, please. Yeah, it's a hard question because I'm in an organization that is so established and known and does have a lot of these relationships. Um, but I think any one of us should be asking ourselves, you know, what what do we stand to gain? Like, what is it that we're looking for? What support are we looking for? What kind of partnership? What what are we asking others to bring? Um, and and to um, it is relationships. Like, do, do you know, do you, does this institution have a good reputation? Do you know someone there? Can you see a way in, um, what, you know, what's their track record in our neighborhood or in our wider community? Um, I think a lot of our institutions have, um, really mixed track records and, and really bad can have really bad ones too, certainly when it comes to land use and development. Um, but you know, ask those those questions and see what where your relationships might move you, and and try to be clear about um, what might be shared interests and maybe where where things might not work. Great, thank you. So the relationship keep coming up. So it's almost like everything old is new again. We have the data, we have the technology, we have the tools, the AI, everything. But what it comes down to as always is our relationships, our interconnections and the trust, basically humanity, right? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna wrap up our Q and A with, I'd love to get any final tips, advice, parting words, anecdotes that any one of our panelists would like to share with our participants today, any, seeds, since we're on this whole garden theme, uh, any food for thought as we close out? It's, um, I always joke about, uh, I always joke about it with Rachel. Um, and it's something we always, we continually fall back on is, is, you know, this is hard work. It's, it's not easy. 
especially if you're being uh, you're really focused on um, genuine participatory engagement. Um, and so it's always it's it's faith and patience. I mean, you got to have in a in a in a high pain threshold and a good sense of humor. Um, you have to you know, and you have to constantly stay engaged. It, it's not like um, Penn said it. It's not it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's constant engagement and and really, um, really, not losing the the humanity in the that the community in the community in yourself in in um in the people across the table in the in in the institutions you know we all i think that we've gotten we've sort of gotten removed from um that component of 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 how we engage with people so i think that's really important thank you charles anybody else If I can just echo that, and I think we're also picking up on things that Penn and, and Minnie said about like it isn't one and done. It is a constant care and, and maintenance of trust building. Um, and it's it is wonderful to be here together and to talk about like here are this where these projects are at this moment. But it it, it has to, please don't be dissuaded by that. And think like oh you know it you know we couldn't do that here. It's it really it has been work. It has been trust building. Um, but it's been, you, you can, I, I, I imagine you can feel it among us. Like we really show up for each other. We have each other's backs. Um, and at the end of the day, like that is what gets us through. Like when, when things get difficult, when things get hard, knowing that we can, we can rely on each other or show up for each other, or as Penn said, like be reflective, like take a moment to go, okay, today really sucked. Today was a really hard day for this project. But I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna take a beat, and I know that my partners are gonna be there, and, and we can, we can come at this again tomorrow, um, and keep fighting, and keep pushing. Um, it really, that's how, that's how we do it. It isn't magic, you know. It's hard work. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I ditto to to, to what everybody said so far. Um, I think for me, it's really, really important that we make sure that the the resources to do this work are really proportionate to the kinds of in you know participation and effort that that the partners are putting out. Um, you know, I've when I was on the community side, I can't tell you how many times I got calls from universities who were looking for a community partner so they could apply for a grant. And usually it was like, if I asked further, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's this humongous grant and, you know, you'll get like 1% of it and it's due like next week and we don't really know each other yet. So, and in those situations, my answer would have been no. And I would advise <laughs> lots of other folks who might be solicited in this way to also say no. But, um, you know, but I think if we actually truly value um, what particularly what community partners and organizations bring, then then it's got to also show up in the resources. And usually there's an imbalance to begin with, right? A lot of the universities typically are much more well resourced and need to figure out how to share better. So um, that's my hope. And and I, I'm really, really appreciative that AmeriCorps funding program really did recognize this and was able to, to do that um, in an equitable way with our partner. Thank you. Thank you all. So if there are no more questions from participants in the chat, and I'm just checking, we will go ahead and wrap up the Q&A for our panel today. Thank you all so much for your participation, for the good information that you have dropped onto the hearts, minds, and spirits of our participants today. And just to move forward, We'll have some tools and resources here that provide further reading, further information about some of the concepts that were shared by our panel members today. And then on your own, we invite you to engage by joining our Places of Impact group on LinkedIn if you're not already a member, and also joining the listserv and inviting your friends and colleagues as well. You can also post to the group on LinkedIn if you have something that you've learned from today's event, 
if you have an example of a strategy or an initiative that you would like to share. And then just a gentle reminder that our next event will be around systems change. And it is just after the New Year's on January 10th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And then there was a question or a request if some of our panelists would be open to speaking more about the more intricacies or nuances of the relationships. So in the slide deck, when it becomes available, you'll have contact information. And we ask if you do reach out asking questions to be kind and be mindful, but the panelists have indicated that they are open to connection. So here's where you can reach and learn more about the work and what they do and what they have shared. All right, and if there are no more questions or nothing else to share, I would like to thank you all for attending our event today. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we look forward to hearing your feedback and seeing your engagement on our Places of Impact group on LinkedIn and the listserv. Have a good rest of your day.